Welcome everyone to this Code Rage 10 session, C++ 11 development for Windows, iOS, and Android. I'm David I, and I'll be hosting the session here with members of the C++ compiler R&D team. We've got uh, Bruno Bebe. Bruno? Hello, this is Bruno. We've got Roger Lawrence. Hello. And we've got Eli Bowling. Hi there. Excellent. That way everybody knows the voices when they're popping in and coming along the way. What we're going to do is talk in general about the compilers and the work that the C++ uh, development team does. And then uh, we've got the ID loaded with some C++ on 11 examples, so we can take a look at some of that if we want to as well. So let's get started. Uh, talking about C++ Builder 10 Seattle, this is now all about building not only VCL, but FireMonkey applications for Windows 10 and for iOS, Android, OS 10. All of that is available. Uh, the team has put together uh, a new updated compiler for Win32 that uses the C++11 language. We still have the existing classic, classic. compiler. Is that the right term, maybe? Classic. You can use the new Clang Enhance compiler, and we'll talk a little more about what Clang Enhance means in a minute for using the same source code on 32 and 64-bit Windows and iOS and Android. And then the ID has been enhanced. Uh, it's a large memory model ID now, so if you've got very large C++ projects, uh, you can load more of those in and do everything inside of the development development environment. It's still a Win32 IDE, but it uses the full extent of the enhanced four gigabytes of user storage for projects and, and work that you're doing inside of the environment. So build and debug large projects, that's all great. Multi-monitor support, all of those features there. Uh, maybe while we're in here, if, uh, I don't know who wants to do this. One of the new capabilities is parallel compilation if you're using the Clang-based compilers. Yeah, this work was done by Agus. Um, he's not here, so I can I can speak a little bit about it. What it is is Clang actually has two modes. Um, one is known as the driver, and then one is called as the well, CC1 is the term we use, or actual the actual compiler. So what we've done is, if you're compiling multiple sources, more than one, and you have many cores in your machine, the driver can actually launch multiple processes to compile the sources. Um, in parallel, I mean, at the same time, it speeds up compilation on projects where you have lots of source code. So, okay, and uh, and again, that's if you're using the the C plus plus compilers that are Clang enhanced for Win thirty two, Win sixty four, iOS and Android, right? Um, actually, this feature is only available on the 3.3 based compiler. Okay. And, and I know you have a slide that talks about that. So for now, it's only available on the, uh, let's say, the Windows compiler for Win32 and Win64. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Again, if you have existing projects that are for Win32 that are using the classic compiler, those still work just fine. Yeah, you can still use the classic compiler. Uh, for old code, but we recommend that you use the Clang-based compiler for new code. All right, so here I just wanted to mention uh, this Clang Enhanced compiler. Again, it's C++11. We have a, a, a C++11 compliance status page for the different versions of the compilers that we ship, so we'll take a look at, at that in a little bit. It supports the usual things, the property method event model, right? Uh, the pre-compiled headers, uh, runtime type information, reference counting for mobile applications, all of that is still there, right? Yes, yeah, and and, and the bulk of what we do is also um, adding all the extensions to support Delphi runtime, uh, which is not necessarily listed there. I mean, it's listed as property method and event, but there's a lot more that goes on behind the scene, like with closures and class methods and Delphi style classes and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So. And we've covered that in, in past code rages yes. and past sessions, the uh, blog post. There's some language enhancements for Windows, for, for UUIDs, for Delphi, yes. runtime type information, and so yeah. on. If you have questions at the end about some of that because you want to refresh your memory, uh, put those in the Q&A log, but uh, we'll keep moving and focusing here. This is that slide I think you're referring to, which is in C++ Builder 10 Seattle. These are all the compilers that are available. Do any of you want to sort of go through each of these? For the most part, what we want to do is be on a single version. So 3.3 is the base version that we're 
targeting and the two Windows compilers are on 3.3. iOS, uh, we stayed on 3.1. It was just a matter of time. We never got uh, had the time to move uh, forward. And uh, iOS 64, we were already on 3.3. And then Android, the same thing. We stayed on 3.1 for the Clang portion, but the LLVM portion was always on 3.3 because we needed some code generation that's in present in the version of 3.3 of LLVM. And the classic compilers are as before. Those haven't changed much. Okay, so those are still what we sort of characterized back then as the C++ 0x. They had a few of the C++. Yeah, some of the early. Early C++ yes. X yeah. uh, features. But if you want the full set of C++ 11, then you're, then uh, use those compilers up above. Yeah, And we'll see the ID in a moment, how you can set the different options and set the number of cores if you're doing parallel compilation and so on. Uh, I want to spend a few moments, and you can all chime in here, about this, how we build compilers, because we're we're in the compiler business, both for Delphi and for C++. You know, we, we don't just get some compilers from somewhere, we download them. Uh, we, we build and in, extend and enhance, and in the case of, of some of this, uh, use the technologies, but add our own, right? Yeah, I mean, there's um, Roger can probably talk a little bit about the the back end um, on the LLVM side because we, we do work on both sides. We do both on the compiler, the front end, and then we do work on the on the back end. And sometimes we do the work because the version that's available out there does not have the features that we need. And then later, the version that's available might uh, implement those features. Like for example, when we first released the 64-bit compiler on Windows, um, we had to do some some work on the LLVM side for exception handling and pData and, and Eli and Roger can probably touch on that. And then on the Clang side, we did a lot of additions for all the Delphi language extensions, but also for Windows extensions. You mentioned earlier UUID, you know, the ability to tie a, a GUID to a to a class, to a type, to a struct. That was not available back then. Now, now of course, that's that's part of core Clang, and it's not something we need to add. But even things like Windows extensions, such as you know DLL import, DLL export, or select any, all of these, uh, if they are not available at the time we are shipping, we will add them to the to front end or back end, wherever it's appropriate. And um, I don't know if Roger wants to touch a little bit about the back end portion. Well, sure. M most of the changes we've made in, in the LLVM back end have, have been to support um, either exception handling or debug information. Um, and, we, and, and, and it's the exception handling that, that's prompted our, our, our use of a higher rev LLVM than the Clang sometimes. That's why we're with the 3.3 the uh, LLVM for, for targeting Android on ARM. We, we're using the 3.5 the on 64-bit um, on iOS because it was the first LLVM version that had a good ARM 64 code generator that we could, that we could reliably use. Um, of course, for Clang 32, which we call BCZ 32C here, um, we had to write a whole new OMF object file emitter plus the giant debugger information. Um, so so it's, it's been a variety of, of efforts, but like I say, mostly to support various debug changes. We're supporting both GDB and LLDB and giant information, and then targeting the different processes, trying to get the, the correct exception handling formats. And I know, Eli, you've done a lot of, I think you were involved in some of the exception handling work as well, right? Yeah, I did the um, runtime library side and the implementation for dealing with Windows. So for um, the client based compilers on both Windows 64 and Windows 32, there was no runtime library support existing in Clang. And so we rolled our own for both Win64 and Win32. Um, and the Win32 version uh, uh, should meet the, I think it should be, from what I see about, the same performance as our existing Win32 exceptions handling support, maybe a little bit faster. Okay, and then things like optimization of code, that's all in the back end, right? We just, we, we leverage that, or do we pass other information uh, to the back end to help in those efforts? For the most part, uh, we we leverage the existing optimizations. There are several passes in LLVM. Uh, Roger can probably expand on that. Um, there are a few areas where we've added something where we see room for um, optimizations. We haven't spent a lot of time on that. Earlier, you had a, a slide that showed ARC, for example. Mm -hmm. That's that's too much um, the automatic reference counting that the Delphi compiler does on Delphi style classes. 
um, that's an area where we would like to add a, a pass for optimizing. Um, but for the most part, on the, the specifics of the optimizations, we, we, we use the LLVM optimizations. Okay. Uh, anything else to add on compilers and, uh, and, uh, and target platforms here? It's just, just that we hope to bring them forward as quickly as possible. We don't like being stuck on, on the older versions of Clang. I think what Roger is referring is the fact that we are already working on um, getting our changes and um, on a newer version of Clang. Uh, currently, the shipping version is 3.7, and that's the one we are currently targeting. So. Okay. There's more than just the compilers as part of the tool chain. There's the compilers themselves, of course. There's linkers. There's libraries. There's generation of code, there's debug symbols, all sorts of things that we talked about, right? And so this is just an example of, of some of the bits that are going on under the covers. iLink32, iLink64, that's our linker, is that right? Yeah, those are our linker. Okay. Xlink? That's our linker. It's it's the OSX uh, linker. Okay, and then LD, yeah. I guess 32 and 64. I think, it's, is, is it the same linker for both 32 and 64-bit iOS? Yes. Apple's linker that we ported and, and are running on the Windows platform with, with some minor changes. And then for Android, GNU LD? Yeah, it's the link, the LD that is included with the NDK. Oh, okay. With Android. And then this is just an example, and we'll go into the IDE. Uh, if you want to use the classic compiler uh, versus the, the non-classic compiler or the Clang Enhanced compiler for Win32, right? So. Yes. Uh, the default, I think, is true still. If you say file new C++ VCL project, FireMonkey project, it's still set uh, to use the classic compiler by default? Yeah, that was a, a, we looked at this for quite a while. And, and we opted to stay with the classic compiler because the bulk of the code that we suspect that our users have are still would be targeting BCC32, um, our classic compiler. With time, we would like to switch over because the Clang Enhanced Compiler allows us access to things like a newer version of Boost, a later version of STL, and, and of course C++11, but for now the default is the classic compiler when you're targeting Win32. So let me switch, I'm going to switch the IDE, I've got a, a, sam a simple sample Windows 32 application here, uh, it just uses auto under the covers, let's look at it, it's just, you know, on the button click, I do a couple autos and then I uh, do a for loop, you know, we're done, right, nothing special there. Go project options, if we go down to the compiler, uh, there's that classic compilers turned off because this is C++11 stuff. If I turn it on and I try to use C++11 and hit compile, let's see, will this one run or will it get me a, yeah, it'll tell You'll me, it, errors yeah, it, it says it, it's some, you know, it doesn't know some things and. Yeah, it doesn't know none member yep. begin and uh, it probably is, is misinterpreting auto there. Yeah, um, yeah quite a yep. few things. There's a lot of things, expression, syntax problems, and so on. So that's your first sign if, you, if you're using the C++11 language things in your source code and you've got that turned on by default, then uh, you want to turn it off and hit uh, compile and run. And it should compile, link, and run, I hope. And there it is. So, okay, nothing special there. Again, file new. Let's go do it this way. If I say add a new project and I choose C++ like VCL form application, for example. And then if I go project options, again, just to show you a classic compiler, it's on by default for now. But you can turn it off project by project. You can still use option sets. So you can always use option sets and apply option sets. You know, just make sure uh, if you're doing a new project and you want to use the full C++11 language, create that project and go in and turn that option off. We're not going to go through uh, the whole list of C++11 features. Uh, there's a doc wiki entry. I have the URL. I'll bring that up in a moment. Uh, I just picked a few. I, you know, there's all these different lists. And I know everybody's got their favorite lists of what are the 10 most useful capabilities in the C++11 language. I think this was some of them. Uh, in the doc wiki, there's two different pages that will help you on C++11 if you want to see what's in the products. The first one is more of a documentation style page, uh, feature supported. It goes through uh, over here in the contents page, some of the highlights of the C++11 language, you know, static assertions and so on. So you can navigate around 
and you'll see some little examples, little text about them. It's not meant to be uh, a textbook on C++11. Uh, the second page here is a page in the doc wiki, and I like this one because it gives you a nice visual reference by each of the compilers, as well as it, it's organized more by the ISO C++ standard committee list, and it includes the, the proposal documents for the different languages as off-page links going down to the uh, Open Standard uh, Working Group 21 uh, document pages for all the different papers. So it's pretty cool if you see something on the list here that you're interested in a little more from a ISO standard view to look at that document and, and the depths and lengths that the committee goes through and members of the C++ language community to explain why this feature is the way that it is. Uh, and we can scroll down and see again, here's, this is the BCC32 column, which is that 0x uh, classic compiler versus BCC32. So you'll quickly see and also OS 10 again, which is the is one of our classic compiler uh, versions versus all of the the Clang enhanced compilers with our extensions. So as we scroll down, let's see alignment support. What is that? Oh, that's in ARM 64. Okay, it's the first one I noticed that was there. Uh, inheriting constructors. There's still a few things down. For example, in the concurrency part that are still being worked on. Or, or on different versions. If you also want to see what the Clang open source project community itself, there's a Clang status on the Clang LLVM page for the latest releases that we're working towards in our development effort. But this is how we're mapping the current release versions of our compilers. So again, you should feel pretty comfortable if you're using all of the Clang Enhanced, our own built versions of our compilers uh, that have C++11 support that you have most of the C++11 language. At the same time, I know that there's work going on as this code rage is happening. There's the next version of the ISO C++ committee meeting uh, I think on the big island of Hawaii in Kailua Kona, really working on the next generation, the C++ 17 uh, version of the language and all sorts of proposals, concepts, light, and other things that we'll see. And again, our team, we're, we're a member of the ISO C++ committee. We have members that go to the meetings. Uh, everybody's contributing. You're also doing all the work here, you guys. Uh, Dawn's not with us right now because she's, uh, she's over at the meeting, making sure that we can stay on the forefront of the C++ worldwide standard ISO C++ language and implementing that in our compilers. Libraries are also involved in, in the world, but this is just uh, some of the, the list of uh, uh, standard C++ libraries and some of the boost information, because we're always asked by C++ developers, libraries are very important both for language standard and for where the language is going. I know the boost community, for example, has pushed ahead a lot of the things that are going on. And some of those like Lambda functions, for example, they get swept into the language standard because of the work going on, right, Lee? Number of them that have uh, come pretty much directly from boost. What we do is is there's different versions of the standard library. We use Dinkumware, right? Is we're a licensee and we ship uh, versions of Dinkumware in our with our compilers. Correct. They're also used by Microsoft. That's their implementation, also. Okay, and then. Uh, I always got confused about this, about what about iOS and what about Android? What do we do for standard libraries there? We actually use what they supply for their native solutions. So for iOS, there's actually there's a standard library, C++ library, that's part of the iOS SDK that we can use and link into our applications for iOS? Correct, yeah. And then for the Android SDK NDK, there's also a, t a standard C++ library. I know Google has been trying to do more with C++, right? Right. The, the different libraries have different levels of implementation so far. So there will be some slight differences when you're talking about C++ when you're using our product between them. So you'll have to be a little bit aware, but, but they're all moving forward. So, and, and every release, they, they get closer and closer. And I also know that I think, and this goes back to some of the Clang LLVM work, there's a whole bunch of companies involved in the world of, com of C++ compilers across all these multiple devices, right? Google's involved, Apple's involved, we're involved. Uh, the meetings usually take place. I don't know who goes, maybe different people go. They're here in the Silicon Valley. I don't know if they're always at Apple headquarters or no, elsewhere. Not anymore. They tend to be. I mean, they, they are in San Jose. Uh -huh. um, they were in San Francisco a couple of years ago. Go, but um, yeah, I, I usually would or Don would attend. I mean, we've all been to the to the LLVM conferences yeah. at some point or another. So, so it's you know it's a great thing to see 
all this great stuff is being done to help C++ developers everywhere across all these different platforms, and we get the benefits in our compilers and our libraries of all of this work. Yeah, and, and it, 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 at, at the conference, you really get a feel that it extends way beyond C++. There are, every language is represented is using some, some portion of maybe just LLVM or some of the tools. So, But yeah, C++ is, is very, very well positioned there, but it extends beyond C++. So. Now, one of the things we did, uh, I think it was different this time, uh, as we have the Get It Package Manager is part of the IDE, and so we, we have Boost. Uh, used to be this in, part of the install, I remember, because I used to install Boost, and you just go away for a while and have a coffee because it's a lot of libraries, a lot of source code to be unzipped and, and put. You could, uh, you could, I could skip it, but if you want it all, then you would see it being installed on your machine. And so what we did this time, and I'll switch to the IDE. So in the past, Boost has been part of the regular install, and, and now instead Boost is separated out so you can choose to install it using the, the Get It Package Manager. So you would get that by going to the Tools menu. So you bring up the Get It Package Manager and you can filter, for example, you could say, show me Boost. Uh, you can go and say, show me all the free or all, or show me just libraries and so on. And then here's that boost 139155 that's for 10 Seattle. And you can click install. I won't do it now because it'll sit there for a little while. But you can choose to install uh, components that are that are out there in the Get It Package Manager, including Boost. So that's how you can go and get Boost if you have projects that need the Boost libraries installed on your machine. And then there's documentation on the doc wiki about how to do things with, with Boost. Again, the other thing is that if you're doing Boost for Windows on uh, the classic compiler, then it'll, it'll use the 139 that's installed. And if you're using Clang enhanced Win32, Win64 compilers, the BCC 32C and the BCC64, it'll use the version 1.55 that's installed and out there. And the environment variables are, are set accordingly and properly so that it, it finds the right libraries for you. Uh, and then we talked about this earlier, uh, Bruno, I think you were talking about it. This is the parallel compilation. There's a general compilation option called, there's, there's actually, I think, two things you need to check, right? You need to check enable batch compilation, if I'm correct, and then also uh, do the uh, run compiler in a separate process and choose how many sub-processes. Yeah, the idea here is usually the IDE would be using the DLL compiler to have access to the parallel compilation. We want to use the command line compiler. So the, the, the so by saying um, use as a separate process, that's what you're saying is use the command line compiler. And then the batch compilation tells the IDE, and by the way, feed the compiler all of my source at once, or at least a lot of them. Don't, don't call the compiler with one of the source file one at a time. Just call the compiler and give it like 10 source file or 15. I'm not exactly sure what the logic is. I know the batch compilation doesn't hand all of your sources to the compiler because I think there's a limitation on the on the command line length. So it takes n number of source files and it just gives it to the compiler. And then in this case, the compiler will then, if you're using Clang, will will launch multiple processes. So, so back in the IDE, let's go and see where these are again. So if I go Project Options, enable batch compilation here, right? So that one, uh, turn that on to true. Then go to Project Properties, and in here I can say Manage, Include, uh, Use Auto Dependency, all of those usual things. Here's the last one, Run C++ Compiler in a Separate Process. And this only shows up if I'm targeting and using the Clang Enhanced Compilers, right? So here, Run C++ Compiler, and then in my VM here, I've told my VM use four, four cores out of my eight core. This is my MacBook Pro, it's got eight cores. So I've told this VM you've got four cores. So there it only shows up if I had eight cores or however many cores, I'd see those as choices and I can choose uh, one to, you know, up to whatever the maximum is, it'll show up in there. If I guess if I had eight, it'd be one through eight uh, over there. And then just say, okay, and then hit build and and all the magic happens. For mobile development on iOS and Android, we need to do automatic reference counting. This is what happens in the mobile world and in these devices uh, that have even less memory and you wanna be very cognizant of what your application is doing. Uh, Delphi has this as well uh, for for its objects that you use. And, and so ARC is there and it's built in uh, to, with the compilers and the runtime uh, when you're do building applications for 
fire monkey multi-device applications using t optic based things and so on anything else to add bruno or anyone about arc here no other than um there's really good documentation to show how to use it and i typically recommend don't don't rely on arc to do your your cleanup uh do the cleanup uh, because we will we will do the right thing. I mean, like for example, you know, use a smart pointer, unique pointer, or shared pointer, or whatever auto pointer. Um, or if you need, call delete, and we will do the right thing. We'll we'll actually decrement the ref count, and if the ref count goes down to zero, the object will be cleaned. I I, I prefer that um, users don't write code that just says, oh, this is arc enabled, so it will get cleaned up by 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 default, because then that code is no longer portable. You can't build that code on desktop. And so delete is great. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Call it's, delete. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a there's a good page somewhere that explains all this. So yeah, uh, new your objects and delete them. I mean, just be a good citizen, and Arc will do the right thing. So. Uh, I just put in a couple notes. This is right out of the doc wiki. Some people ask, well, how do I do? specific code for specific compilers and specific platforms. And so you can find all of this information in the doc wiki. There's some defines that are available for you to use, the Borland C compiler, the the Clang enhanced compilers, uh, the platform specific or, or processor. So Android and ARM, for example, and then you put your code. If you, for some reason that you want to have specific if def code inside of your source code for moving back and forth on platforms. Uh, I could have added other ones in there as well, you know, iOS and OS 10. There's all of those defines are there for you so that you can have your version specific code and, and platform specific code. There was this one comment uh, that I copied from the doc wiki maybe one of you can chime in about rtl version constant and clang enhanced compilers well the the bottom line is is um the classic compiler allowed you to use constants that are floating point numbers but that's not um allowed in the standard the preprocessor does not support floating point numbers that's not there so if your typical code you, you'd say pound if rtl version is greater than let's say 24.0 well great that worked with a classic compiler but it won't work with a standard compliant compiler which includes clang so there's a new constant now that's rtl version c uh, the same thing for fmx version it's just we are introducing a new version that is compliant with the standard and so I just wanted to do a, a couple more samples. So this first one I just call Lambda Demo. It's got a single button in the user interface. And on the button click handler, I'm using an auto and setting this Lambda, the this pointer, that's the capture variable that I'm using so that I can get to the label one. So I'll just take this first simple project and I'll run it on Win32 and see that I can now use C++11 language capabilities on Win32. So it compiles and links and there's a Win32 using a, a C++ Lambda. I'll also go to my iOS device and we'll set its target, compile and run this example. 64-bit, there's the splash screen. Here's the example. I'll click on the button, lambda, 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 and it gets the code within a lambda expression put in the label's text property. We'll switch back to a second example in the ID. This one is using the parallel programming library that's part of the system threading unit. And here I've got the task run method, and I've got a lambda embedded inside the task run method call, again, capturing the this pointer so that I could output information to the form. And then I've got an embedded lambda as well to do a thread synchronize so that I could add to the memo lines that's in the user interface. I've got two buttons, one that starts the task and a second button that will just display the, the current value of the variable value. So we'll go and compile this second example for 32-bit windows. So we'll start the background task and we'll show the value and the lambda is working away and I can look at the current value that's being updated in the task. It's finally done. Let's compile for 64-bit windows. And again, the background task, look at the values. It's doing a sleep and doing its work until finally the background task is done. And then finally, let's go and select iOS device 64-bit. So I'll go and compile and run this. There's the splash screen and I can click on the background task button and start showing the value by tapping on the second button until the task is complete and everything's done. Okay, just to summarize here, uh, C++11 now on Win32 and Win64, iOS 3264 and Android. 
uh, the ID with the large memory model ID for, for your large projects. Again, you can do all your Windows 10 work, do your C++ work, do your library-based work, whatever it is. And if, you're, if you've got existing projects, you can leave. If they're Win32 only, you can use the Classic Compiler, or you can turn off using the Classic Compiler and start enhancing and extending your C++ projects using the power of the C++11 language. Uh, it works with VCL, the C++11, and FireMonkey multi-device. So you can, you know, you're you're uh, you're safe to go in the water now and not having to figure out how to deal with C plus plus zero X versus C plus plus eleven on different platforms. You now have the support for uh, for Windows desktop and for for mobile. But again, we're moving forward. This is active work going on by the development team, uh, never ending, moving on to the future. So uh, it's great to have you all with us here in Code Rage, and also now you have the power of using C++11 on Win32, Win64, iOS, and Android, so that's really great. Uh, any other words to add, anyone? I, I want to hear from customers who try the new compilers. I want to know. I'm sure there are things that we, you know, the classic compiler handles that uh, the client-based compiler does not, and we want to know about these so that we can evaluate and, and uh, do the right thing. So. Uh, Roger, anything to add? I don't think so. Just um, give us the uh, give us the feedback. And Eli, um, no, like our Roger, uh, we're looking forward to seeing what people say, and and we'll keep um, updating these tools as we go, and make them bigger and better. It's not only a fun language, but a fun tool set. And to see us continually moving forward in the C++ language for all our customers is a great thing. We started this in Turbo C++ way, way back when. And uh, it's come a long, long way, the power and, and capability that we have now, not only with the frameworks, but with the compilers and the language as well. It's really cool. So with that, we're going to turn it over to questions, and uh, we'll invite you to put questions in the question log, and we'll answer them the best we can. Again, thank you, team. I mean, Delphi has support for Android services, and but C++ doesn't yet. But you know, we want to have the same functionality on both uh, on on platforms where we have it for one or the other language, right? It just wasn't. You know, there's more work to be done. Is that it? That's correct. We just need to spend a little more time uh, for the C++ side. Okay. Um, here's another question from Ken. Will the classic compiler be used by default for existing projects? Yes, that's the goal, is to keep the classic compiler uh, at least for a while for by default for projects. Uh, even newly created projects also use the classic compiler. You have to go out of your way to to enable the Clang-based compiler. Now, of course, uh, I guess, but if you if your existing project is for iOS or Android oh. or Win64. <laughs> <Okay>. Yes. If, if it's one of the platforms where we we don't have a classic compiler, I was referring to Win32, of course. But, yeah, for Win64, iOS or Android, it will always be the Clang-based compiler. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Ludo saying, this is sort of long. I'll see if I can. Um, it was talking about... Um, you know, if you have projects or issues in using languages, if we think about going back to C++ 98, C++ 2003, and now we're at C++ 11, uh, is there anything that developers can do to turn on or off warnings? Um, there, are, there are a set of warnings. Um, the, the, the issue with us, we require C++ 11 um, at least for Delphi compatibility, because there are several features of the Delphi language that um, match or were very nicely um, blended with C++11 features. Um, so, so those are things that we couldn't support until C++11. So by default, when you use um, our compiler that's based on Clang, we default, meaning we hard code internally that it's C++11. Uh, you'd have to go out of your way to turn off uh, C plus plus eleven and then enable either ninety eight or two thousand three or so it is it is possible um, if you use what's called the CC one mode where you basically pass the low level compiler options directly but if you don't do that we will be it, it's C plus plus eleven okay great. Um... 
Oh, and then he's, he's mentioning with BCC32, he was able to enable disable certain warnings with a unique number. With Clang compilation, there need, seems to be no error warning unique numbers attached. Is there a plan for some feature or option? Uh, that's true. There are no unique numbers attached. Um, it's actually something that we've, we've struggled a little bit with. Um, we, we generate a unique number right now, but that number is not unique across versions. When new warnings get added or removed, the number moves around. Um, the way that the Clang compiler works is you can disable or enable groups, but usually there's a lot of warning belonging to a particular group. To have the kind of granularity we had with the classic compiler, we would essentially have to put every single warning in a, in a single group. Um, and that's not ideal, and that's not even desirable sometimes. So um, it's it's not something we solved. And if there are particular warnings that you absolutely want to be able to enable and disable, let us know because we can move some warnings into a group, but um, but not not. I don't think we would do a case where every warning would be its own group. Okay. I'll just say if you have some specific warnings you might want in a group, let us know. Okay. And, all oh, right. Um, in the ID, units will not be properly linked when we use the new header guard defined once. Is there some reason for this? I'm not sure what he's saying. Header guard pound defined once. Um, maybe pragma ones, pound pragma ones, I can imagine. Um, yeah, traditionally what we've done, we, we use the typical pattern, you know, if and def, whatever, xxx, and then define xxx, that, that would be the first thing at the top of the header, excluding comments. And then at the very, very bottom of the header, there'd be a pound and diff that matches the, the if and def at the top. Um, that's the approach we use. Uh, there was an effort at some point to support Pound Pragma once, but we, I don't even know whether the implementation was done. Um, so I would say to use the pattern, um, and if there's a request to support Pound Pragma once, it's something we can look at. Okay. Um, let's see, with Clang use for both 32 and 64-bit compilers, I, I, I'm going to say on Windows, I guess here, will this also resort in, result, or for all the compilers, the Clang enhanced, does this mean we'll get new language features faster in the future? Oh, yes, yes, that's the goal is um, currently we're on version 3.3. Um, we've started the move to 3.7. Um, and um, the idea is, yes, as we move to newer versions, um, we plan to keep adding features that are specific to Embarcadero, um, but at the same time we will also gain for free all the, all the wonderful work that the Clang team has been doing. So. I think this one for you, Lee. Uh, what about Boost 159? Uh, we, we typically want to move to later versions of Boost and uh, we just, uh, you know, take a little while to certify, rebuild it, package it up. So uh, I would imagine the next release we'll, we'll be uh, updating to, you know, if I nine or whatever is current at that moment. It does. It's, the, it's, a, it's a big library though, right? I mean, it's, it's a huge library, right? So it does take time to make sure that it's all uh, working right. But uh, yeah, we're uh, we're all over Boost, absolutely. Uh, what does the option force C++ compiler do? Is there an option force? Uh, is this better oh. when you only code in C++ or is it a yeah, legacy force option? Force C++ compiler just means that if you have a .c file, you can still tell um, the compiler to treat it as though it was C++. Because by default, when the compiler sees you know test.c, it will treat it as a plain C file. It's it's equivalent to the dash p on the classic compiler, so it's it's it does the right thing behind the scene. It, it passes the right option to the compiler and say treat this code as C plus uh, plus. Ken is saying excellent content. Cool. It's great having the team here instead of just be all by myself. Um, okay. Uh, is there any other benefits for precompiled headers besides the 
compilation speed up process? No, no. The, the main purpose is to speed up compilation. Um, it does yield great benefits if you do take time to set it up, though, because um, we just, I don't remember what we put, but I believe the ID just put fmx.h or vcl.h, depending on which framework you're using, inside of your PCH file. Um, it it helps if you, once you've established what, what are the libraries that you're using to actually add a few more things to it. I've seen uh, big improvements in compilation speed and code completion by taking time to set up a good PCH. Yeah. Okay. Um, this one, uh, it's from Johannes. Is the new 32-bit compiler exactly equal to the 64-bit compiler? Because I'm, I have a program compiling linking and running without problems on 64-bit windows, but on new 30 bits, I get I get linking errors on the same program. Or is this something for technical support? I wonder if he's is he trying to link the object files from 32-bit? Well, it depends on what what the unresolved externals are. Um, I would, um, yeah, I, I, I would assume at this point this is either for technical support or something you can file a JIRA. Um, the, to answer the question, they are the exact identical compilers, meaning they are built from the same source code. We, don't, we, we have one build process that produces both at the same time. Internally, they have different code paths because, well, you're targeting different architectures. So, um, we do do things slightly differently depending on whether we are generating OMF, which we do on Win32, or ELF uh, on Win64. But um, as far as unresolved external, I'd want to see the error message first to before I can determine what the reason should be. But in the ideal case, the code if you have code that builds on 64, it should also build on 32. So it's probably a bug that we would want to look at. Okay. Um. Let's see. With every year I use C++, there appears to be more and more I don't know and want to learn. Very cool language. If you keep up maintaining, I'll keep on using it and loving it. That's great to hear. Thank you for that. They're smiling behind my back here. Um, can we as developers use big data access greater than 2 gigabytes to... Um, I mean, the idea is now we'll use more than two gigabyte. As a developer, if you're doing 64-bit, you've got large memory model. Is there a way to say large memory model Win32, other than playing with the little bits at the beginning of the executable? Right. There's. No. Uh, I mean, of course, if you've, if you've switched your uh, Windows machine to allow the access, uh, and there are flags you can pass to uh, to Linker that will will enable those bits in the portable executable header okay. for you. Okay, so check the linker uh, options there. To build Win32 large memory. Okay. For Win32. Oh, let's see. This is someone who's coming from Visual Studio and MFC. What is the best switch with a market arrow? Clang and FireMonkey. I'll answer this, I guess, in that depending on what you want to develop, if you want to develop multi-device application you know, for Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android, then uh, use FireMonkey. If you're doing console apps, uh, DLLs, Dialibs, or whatever, then you know just build these things the normal way that you would do it with any compiler, including ours, um, service apps, and so on. Um, if you want to build Windows only, but you may want to get to multi-device to iOS and Android and so on. Then again, FireMonkey and C++ is a great, great way to go. Uh, if you're only ever going to do uh, C++ on Windows, then the, our C++ compilers for Windows and the VCL, Visual Component Library, uh, is much easier to, to do and work with than, than using the Windows API directly. But you could also call Windows API. You get a window handle and create a window and create a dialogue and, and do all of that stuff. So I think it's really more as you as you um, decide what types of projects you want to build, and especially multi-device that's uh, where native code, the game in town, not managed code, native code on all the platforms with real optimizing compilers, linkers, and code optimizers, and so on. 
Uh, will Visual Studio play well with Seattle 10? Uh, they can sit on the same system. We don't clobber anything that, that is related. You can even use multiple versions of our product on the same machine, and they play well with each other. So if you've got Visual Studio on your machine, uh, download the trial or purchase, and they'll, uh, they'll work fine. Um, let's see. Even with parallel compiling, it seems like the Clang compiler takes much longer to compile our project. It also doesn't detect which files have been changed. It tries to compile every file in our project. Is this a bug or something else? Um, I would say it's a, it's a feature lacking. Yes, it is. So what's happening is with uh, the first release of the Win32 client compiler, we did not um, generate dependency records. So those are the records that are stuffed in the compiler um, in the OBJ that allows the IDE to determine whether your file should be rebuilt or not based on a header change or source change. And so that's on, uh, that's planned for the next uh, release. We're looking at that. Um, and as far as the speed is concerned, yeah, that one, I don't know, I wouldn't say, well, that's not a feature release. That's just something that we have to spend some time to look at. We are aware that the classic compiler was very fast or is very fast, I should say. And um, we just haven't had a lot of time to look at ways to speed up uh, the Clang-based compilers. But that's something that even the Clang um, community is looking at. So moving to new versions helps, but we also want to do some, some, some things, especially for the areas that we've touched. Um, um, we've noticed a particularly slow on package when we generate packages, so th there's work left to be done there. There's work we have to do. So, Yeah, and uh, he was saying he did mean pound pragma once. But yes, that's what I, I imagine, yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, we cannot link our existing projects using the Clang compiler building a static exe. If we're getting all units to compile out our project with Clang, we get a linker error, unresolved external. It's oh, under bar, under bar, SEH, under bar personality. That's structured exception handling. Is that what that yeah, is? Yeah, but that's actually, it's not just a structured exception handling. It's used for even for C++ exception handling because, well, C++ exception handling runs on top of SEH. That particular error, that unresolved external, under bar, under bar, SEH, under bar, personality, under bar, V, and so forth, usually means that you're running, you're, you're linking with a, with a runtime for the classic compiler. So there are two sets of external that we usually see. We, we often see the underbar SCH, underbar personality. That's when a, a project compiled with the Clang-based compiler but is linking with the runtime for the classic. Or you could see the other one, which would be underbar, underbar, init, except block, um, which would be the reverse, a, a, a project compiled with a classic compiler but linking with the Clang-based runtime. So my suggestion here is to is to check the link line and make sure that Win32C is before Win32. So you'll see, I don't know, something like lib slash Win32C slash debug or slash release. And then you should see lib Win32 slash debug or release. If the order is reversed, then we will pick up the runtime for the classic compiler. And that's usually when you'll see this unresolved external underbar, underbar, ICH, underbar personality. If that doesn't help, please um, email one of us or file file a, a Jira. We'll take a peek. Okay. Um, wow, lots of questions. This is great. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're going. It was going back to the which compilers are which versions. Those are listed on the doc wiki. 64-bit versus 32-bit 3133. So on desktop, the Clang-based compilers are 3.3, so Win32 and Win64. iOS and Android, we are on 3.1. And uh, which one did I leave out? Oh, iOS 64 is also on 3.3. So it's pretty much um, okay. iOS 32 and Android are, are the two lagging behind, and the rest is on 3.3. And that should change hopefully soon. Let's see, using the client compiler, we had to manually add any of our third-party tools into the include path and link lib, pass report, 
TMS and whatever. We didn't have to do this with the classic compiler, which makes our class which makes our projects dependent on exact installed paths. That is very surprising. Um... I, I think that maybe they have to check with our tech partners to see where where they're putting they you know they should be putting the same pattern right on directories as we do. Yes, because I mean there's there's a key here that that I'll I'll mention. You compile Delphi based code only once, and both the classic and the Clang based compiler are compatible with the Delphi ABI. What I mean by that is if you have a library that's written in Pascal, you need to compile it only once. The HPP is generated, the OBJ, the lib, the BPI, the BPL, all of these are consume, consumable by both the classic and the Clang based compilers. But that's where the, the compatibility stops. At that point, when you're creating C++ code that may derive from these classes or those declarations, now they each have their own unique ABIs. Now they're no longer compatible with each other. But if those were HPPs that were from a third party uh, vendor, um, one location should work. Like, you can look at the way we do our own. Um, we have one include path for things that are from the Delphi RTL or from FMX or from BCL, and they work with both compilers. So you don't need anything special. Um, so unless that particular library was a C++ library, if it was a Delphi library that you're consuming from C++, then I am a little surprised. That's, that should not be the case. Uh, but contact the tech partner or send me an email, David I at embarkado.com. Tell me the tech partners. It looks like you were mentioning uh, Fast Report and TMS. So uh, I can I can check with them and see what uh, what they're doing in generating uh, the right things uh, in the right spots. Um, Oh, here it goes back to the Visual Studio. If, if Visual Studio is supporting Clang, we have our own versions of Clang, right? There's no shared Clang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and even the way Visual Studio supports Clang is is very different from from the Clang open source project, which is very different from our version of Clang. So, yep. So, okay. Oh wow, let's see. About linking errors. If I'm using 32-bit objects, I'm probably not, but made FMX project of it. Okay, well, we'll check. Let's see. Converted 32-bit project into FMX project. It has no problem using 64-bit compiler. Great. Okay. Um, there is an option to enable full debug information. Will this mean there will also be an option like selective debug information in the future? Yes, well, I can explain a little bit what happened here. The full debug information is, um, so the amount of debug information generated can can vary. So let's say you have a pointer to a type, a pointer to a T button. Um, the compiler can generate just the fact that you have a pointer to a T button, but doesn't necessarily need to follow what T button itself is. But that's a problem because when you're watching T-Button, if it's a pointer, that's fine. But then when you click on that little expand in the debugger, usually it shows you what you're pointing to. It shows you all the members of T-Button. So the full debug information just says go beyond the first level, like go deep if you want, you know. Um, so I believe we have full debug information on by default. But you can actually say I want less debug information um, Roger would, he's not online right now, uh, he would be able to explain that a little better. It's, it's the way that the, the backend LLVM generates debug information. You can actually do a very thorough, but which means that the same information is duplicated over and over and over in every OBJ, or you can go with a minimal uh, debug information. And um, Email David or I, and I'll I'll get you more information about that. So, but the, the options between full and just normal will will be there. But I don't know whether we have any plans on doing more granular than that. I think the, those would be what we will leave as is right now. Okay, and again, Ludo or others, just send me an email if there's. You can put things in quality.marketo.com as well. Uh, both is good. 
put it in quality so it gets logged. Any suggestion, you know, if there's something you're seeing, uh, send me an email. I put Bruno's email address in there as well.